Hey, what's up? It's Phoenix. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I hope that you'll check out my books. I hope you'll check out my other videos. Thank you for watching. I appreciate having you here. So what's new on the shelf? What's new on the shelf with Phoenix? Well, The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk. I'm super excited about this book. It does detail some very heavy things as the book is about trauma, but I wanted to actually talk about this book partly because of how it inspired me to think about mental illness and trauma, but also with thinking about how we can heal from such things and the adversity and trauma that we might experience in life. I'm very excited because I definitely have been thinking a lot about this book um, and what it entails for me and my thinking. And so I wanted to talk about that today. Now I've actually utilized some of this material for my job because there's a lot of helpful principles that Bessel talks about in this book and in some of his um, videos that he's made and the interviews that he's been in, plus some writings that you can find on the internet on his website. And you can imagine that working at a rehab center, it would be very helpful to go over trauma and to talk about ways of overcoming the traumas that we may have faced in our lives. And so I wanted to talk about some of the key principles here because I think it's important to go over. I think that it deals a lot with very important things that are worth considering in our day-to-day -day lives of the average per person and in the average population. And I think it's a great place to start. So first off, we could start with just the simple aspect of interrogating what trauma actually is. And Bessel talks about trauma as being something that is actually very common, which normally we would see trauma as being very like this rare event that only happens to some people, like people like war veterans, for instance. But what Bessel has been able to figure out in his research from being a clinician for so long and actually seeing what's going on on the front lines, he started to develop an understanding that trauma comes out, even the, out of even the simplest things that you wouldn't expect. So for instance, you know, children experience trauma. Children have a very difficult time growing up with trauma and it, infect, it affects their emotional and their emotional and social lives and their relationships. And there's a lot of different ways of unpacking why this happens. One of the biggest reasons why it seems to happen is because some children are unfortunate to grow up in, in violent homes in the worst cases, but even places where maybe their caregiver doesn't always know how to be emotionally present. So one of the things that Bessel talks about that I think is super interesting about this matter is when he describes how children who experience trauma weren't taught how to fix ruptures in relationships. So in a healthy relationship, a child can be securely attached to their caregiver by being able to have a conflict and then being able to come back later and be able to deal with that with their caregiver and be, and be very loving to each other. And for some people, that rupture is never fixed. For some people, they aren't allowed to really fix that rupture. It's just the, the scary disagreements or fights become something that is never confronted or healed. Uh, the rupture is never completed, is completely sealed. And so I think this is super fascinating because I've actually thought about this where in my relationships, I do have trouble coming back after there's been a rupture. And that is partly because I have responded to things in the world that I don't always know what to do with. And it has to do with the attachment style and ways of approaching relationships that I have, that I experienced growing up and that, that feed over into my life now. Now, as far as trauma goes, like we were saying, we wanted to talk about the intensity of trauma and try to kind of break down what it is. You know, in DBT, which is DBT therapy, stands for Dialectical Behavioral Therapy, there is this idea that you learn how to deal with difficult things by being able to describe them in words. But there are two points that I think Bessel hits on about trauma that I think are incredibly important. One is the fact that with trauma, you are not seen. In those traumatic moments, you aren't seen by the people who 
create that trauma. And in a very extreme sense, the second point is that often trauma comes from beings trying to annihilate us. That is the intense phrasing that Bessel uses to describe this concept. And so what happens is people in those traumatic moments are unable to use words. So even though we know that using words helps us to be able to confront things and talk about things and, and understand them, there's a way in which when you're in the trauma, you have none of that. It completely breaks down. That's why you're completely silent in the face of terror is the way that Bessel describes it. And it's super sad, super complicated that that is what happens. But generally, we have traumatic memories because of the fact that we are on the verge of being annihilated. And it is a very strong term to use, but I think it's an important way of looking at it that I think is very powerful. Now, one of the things that Bessel talks about is the body keeping the score. And people wonder, what does this mean? What does it mean for the body to keep the score? Well, it means that the emotions and trauma are stored in our bodies. And so we feel them in our bodies. When I'm super nervous, I feel myself sweating uh, I feel, and perspiring. I feel myself closing in and, and I feel myself shaking as if it's very cold, where sometimes it is even cold. Um, and there's a lot of things that happen, like my stomach tightens, my heart starts pounding. And there are various symptoms that happen. That's kind of the idea of the body keeping the score. Yes, it is very easy to focus on our psychological lives and kind of abstract things, and there's definitely value in that. But as Bessel talks about, it seems that we've kind of moved away from the body because we've almost disembodied our practices like psychology. And we've kind of moved away from the very commonsensical view of living embodied, so living in our bodies. And I think that it's super interesting to think about. Now, so... There's one idea that, going back to kind of childhood trauma, which is this idea that, you know, it affects the way that we relate to people when we're adults and the issues that we may have. But one thing that I think is important to be aware of is that there are real effects to abuse that children face. And one of them is something that Bessel talks about in a way that I find very emotionally charged but important, which is that you... If you live in a violent home or live in an abusive household, as an adult or even as a child, you tend to see dangerous things where there is no danger. So they actually use this example of an experiment. Kids who were victimized, brutalized, and traumatized did live in a situation where if someone would ask them, hey, what does this evoke for you, this image or this idea, that image, like a picture, for instance, a photo, it might be very neutral and nothing's happening, but they can read in to it and imagine violence right around the horizon. So accidents that might happen or fights that might occur or deaths even in the worst cases where people might be killed. And it's super sad, I think, that this is literally what happens. I can't even imagine that this is real, that people struggle so much as an adult or child even because of the way that they grow up. And I think that it's really sad. But I think it's important to be aware of that there is that common principle that people that have grown up in those households may not have had a chance to fully ground themselves because people that are securely attached in their relationships growing up into their caregiver and that do have pr lead pretty good lives as kids, they tend to not see danger. It's usually actually very benign. So I just wanted to pause on that because I think it's an interesting impact of trauma that definitely can't be ignored. Now, there was one concept that I find really fascinating, which is related to the study of mirror neurons. And so mirror neurons are interesting because they're neurons that, were, that are designed to mimic the emotions, expressions, and de demeanors and behaviors of other people. And so this is important because Bessel uses the examples, for instance, of, you know, when someone else is upset, you find yourself to be upset. Whenever someone else is happy, you find yourself to be happy. And that's because you're mimicking them. And this is the basis for empathy. Empathy is when we can feel what other people are feeling. And that's what our mirror neurons allow us to do. Not only is it the basis of empathy, but it's also the basis of having healthy relationships. If we know what people are experiencing, it's a lot easier to talk to them and a lot easier to understand where they're coming from. And it's easier for our relationships to be a very positive thing. Now, one thing that I think is important to also mention is that one thing that also leads to trauma that might be an unexpected source is whenever there are breaks in relationship, but maybe breaks or ruptures that um, are 
maybe misreadings. So it might be that you see someone doing something that they're not actually doing. And I wonder about this because they call them misreadings, for instance. And I do this in my relationships where I misread what's going on and I interpret something and create a story around something that wasn't even happening the way that I thought it was. But this is why there's so many miscommunications that lead to conflict in relationships and sometimes even a breakdown in relationships, where when you're not able to read what's going on intuitively and you're kind of misreading the situation, that's why that happens though. People come from their subjective point of view. And so it's very easy for them to project onto things and think that those things are there that actually aren't even there. But this is why it's so difficult to escape trauma because people miscommunicate all the time and it leads to conflicts and misunderstandings. And that partly leads to trauma. So I, I think it's, it's an interesting thing to be aware of because it literally is this idea that people who are in conflict might be in conflict for reasons that might have been able to be avoided if people were able to read into it and uh, correctly. And so the reason why that's important is because that is part of what's going on, is that we misread what people are doing. And that leads to a lot of conflict. Now, circling back to the whole idea of what you would call an internal locus of control. So kids who grew up in secure, attach, in secure attachment with their caregivers, they, are, they definitely have an internal locus of control because they feel as though they do have a say in what happens and they do have autonomy. And kids who didn't live in that kind of environment and had a lot of childhood adversity, they live in a situation where they are less likely to have an internal locus of control. And I know that, you know, to an extent that's what happens with me where I see everything as being external. I don't see myself as having a lot of power or a lot of impact on what happens. And that may be there and it may be realistic sometimes to have that view, but it's also important to just acknowledge that, you know, the ideal would be an internal locus of control where you feel like you actually impact the things that are happening around you. Now, I think this book is super interesting with the way that it talks about dissociation, depersonalization. There's a term called alexithemia, which is this idea that you struggle to understand, interpret, and convey your emotions. And so the thing that's interesting is that in people that are experiencing trauma, they tend to experience trauma in such a way to where they um, do detach from, basically they do detach from their bodies. They have these very like disembodied experiences. And there are actually a lot of examples of this even in nature, you know, where maybe some organisms, including humans, but also animals might fight or flight go into the fight or flight response, or they might call for help if it's a human or even animal where they might try to get help. But there's also another one where the animal goes limp when a predator is attacking it because it's, it's not just plain dead, it's literally dissociating. It's in a traumatic experience and so it has to detach from its own perspective. And I just, I think that's interesting because these are things that really happen where it's easier for us to dissociate. And dissociation has its own definition and it has its own practice, it has its own implications in the practice of medicine and clinical clinical work. But it is just super interesting to think that that does happen where one way that people survive traumatic experiences is by having your, um, your dissociating experience where you kind of become disembodied in a way. Now, this is something that I think about. Uh, I'd like to close on this note because I think it's super interesting but also important to be aware of. There are actually a lot of practices that people can engage with in order to escape, well not even escape, though that would be nice, I should say in order to process trauma and in order to get through traumatic events. And there are actually some unexpected ones. So one possibility is of course medication, but there's more than medication, there's also psychotherapy. So that would, generally you could call it talk therapy, though it's a little bit more in depth because there's a lot of different things that they do in those kinds of therapies. But you could just say broadly, just call it psychotherapy, so meeting with the therapist and working through issues. But then there's others. There's internal family systems, which is a form of therapy, which I don't know a lot about, but it tries to integrate all of the parts of ourselves and includes the exiles, which are the parts of ourselves that we don't look at, that we ignore, that we cast out and literally exile. And so IFS is one possible way if you have a therapist who does IFS, that could be super helpful or even looking into it on your own and kind of just seeing what it represents. But there's also another one, aside from DBT, 
and aside from CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, there is also EMDR. And EMDR is actually really showing us that we can reprocess trauma, that if we can follow a skilled and, and licensed therapist, we can actually engage with EMDR and find a way to heal and from various traumas and find a way of reprocessing it. But there's also other unexpected things that you wouldn't think about. Yoga. Yoga is actually a good way of getting the breathing and the heart, which is the sign of a healthy functioning body, to align. And it's just super interesting to think that yoga, the practice of yoga can do that because we've known that yoga has a lot of impacts and benefits. But there are also others, other benefits that come from yoga. And I just think that that's super interesting. There's also another one that I'm actually very interested in and that kind of surprises me, which is theater, acting, literally acting in a play by being able to recite the lines and practice them. You're engaging in this emotional world where you can capture emotions that you might not normally be able to. But instead of just thinking all the time in theater, you're actually acting. So you're acting it out and it helps you see possibilities and potentialities. And so theater is actually kind of an unexpected way of dealing with trauma. And I just think it's super interesting because it's not really what I would have expected, honestly. And so definitely look into your options. Uh, even psychedelics have come up. I don't know how I feel about psychedelics actually personally because at my work we, we do subscribe to the idea of, of abstinence from drugs. But on the other hand, there are, there is, just to be aware of, there is a lot of information that's coming in about how psychedelics can also be used to treat, to treat, uh, to treat people from trauma and to kind of open up the mind. So yeah, there's a lot more that could be said about Bessel van der Kolk's work. I think I want to end it there for now though, but I definitely recommend checking out his book, The Body Keeps the Score, which I think is pretty amazing that he was able to write this book and use his experiences and knowledge and clinical research to be able to really think about mental health and how trauma impacts our lives. And so, yeah, I definitely hope you'll check it out. I hope you enjoyed this discussion. I hope you find this helpful for your own life and maybe for overcoming your own adversity and your own traumas in life and understanding more how the mind works and the psychology behind it. So yeah, I'm Phoenix. Thank you for watching and I will see you around. Thank you.